Kumudini Pati, an independent researcher associated with the Center of Women's Studies, University of Allahabad. And we are taking up the subject of women's studies. This is paper 15, the stories the states tell and module 21, which deals with the life and struggles of Adivasi women. Now, who are the Adivasis? They are the indigenous people of India or the tribals as they are called and they make up around 8.6 percent of the national population. Their number actually might exceed 104 million tribals which is undoubtedly the largest tribal population in any country. Now, the concentration of Adivasis according to the 2011 census is such that maximum Adivasis are to be found in the northeastern states which are followed by Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, then Odisha and Andhra Pradesh. We talk about the status of Adivasi women today. Actually, the status of women in tribal societies is much better than that of non-tribal women, although they are increasingly being oppressed in many ways. For example, if you see the sex ratio of the scheduled tribes in India, according to a 2011 census, we see 990 females per 1000 males, which is almost 50-50. Whereas, for the general population, it is just 943 and the child sex ratio among tribals is 957. Our tribal women in the workforce are many more than in the general population. Tribal women are engaged in all kinds of labor. Tribal females in the workforce constitute 43.49% whereas the all India figure stands much lower at 25.51 percent. However, the number of tribal women who are engaged in agricultural work is steadily declining. In the last 10 years, it has been going down because of the impact of globalization, because tribals are now losing their land in the name of development. If you see the custom of marriage among tribals, it is quite different from the general population. Among the Adivasis, marriage is actually not a religious sacrament. It is a civil contract and it is performed in different ways depending on the customs which are prevalent within a particular community or the circumstances which prevail in the two families. We have seen that Adivasi women many times choose their own partner. It is not like what it is among other populations. In many marriages, you will see that a bride price is paid, not like dowry. It, the bride price is actually paid to the girl's father. And many times, this kind of a marriage is also called a marriage by purchase. Similarly, if you see the custom of divorce, then it is quite common among Adivasis. For example, among the Jonsari Adivasis, it is usually the younger wives who desert the husbands for other partners if there is any kind of dispute between them. Village councils sometimes decide on the annulment of marriage if it is required through customary laws. In short, these tribal women actually have the right to choose their own partners and leave them if they so desire. Similarly, if you look at descent, then you will see the tribal society descent is quite different. It may be through mother's line, which is the matrilineal system, or through the father's line, that is the patrilineal system. With the exception of the Khasis, the Jayantiyas, the Garos and the Lalungs of Meghalaya in the northeast who follow the matrilinear system, most of the others follow the patrilinear system. 
but the Mapilas of Kerala is also a matrilinear community. And in many cases, in this community, the same kind of tradition is followed as also in the Northeast. In rare cases, bilineal descent is also there. So, what is this practice of giving bride price? If we go into the details of this, you will see that in most marriages, a bride price is paid as a compensation to the girl's father, because the woman is actually doing a lot of labor in her father's house and she is an economic asset for the family. So, when she leaves the house, a compensation has to be paid. This is why the bride price has taken the place of dowry in the tribal society. But nowadays, we see that bride price is giving way to the system of dowry. Why is this happening? This is because woman's status in tribal society is also changing rapidly. Now, she is becoming more of a liability than an asset because of her declining economic status. So, this economic status of the tribal women actually depends on the economic roles that they play. They had been forest dwellers and they were dependent on the forest for food gathering and they used to do much more work than the men. So, actually it was the women who were sustaining the economy. But now what has happened is that the forest land is being taken away from them and so their status is also declining. Now, what is happening to the tribal women in a globalized economy? Times are changing and women more than men who used to walk long distances to fetch wood and fodder and do lot of the work in the forest. They used to collect fruits and roots and tuber, lac, gum, tendu patta and leaves even for self consumption or for sale. Their lives are totally changed today. With large scale deforestation, building of big and small dams, with power plants coming up, with SEZs coming up and large scale displacement, now women have to toil more than they used to toil in the tribal economy. So, their roles and their lives are seeing a sea change. In the globalized economy, because women are being displaced from their traditional land and their forests, they are forced to work in brick kilns and on construction sites to earn a living. And so, they become more and more vulnerable. There are the contractors and the middlemen who sexually and economically exploit them. And their men have to migrate away from the village in search of work. So, the whole burden of looking after the family and of sustaining it falls on the woman. Now, tribal women in agriculture used to be involved in jhum cultivation, but now jhum cultivation is losing its viability and it is being replaced by permanent terraced wet rice cultivation. And we are seeing that multi cropping practices are being replaced by mono cropping and cash crops and horticulture are getting preference. So, women are also losing their labor. In many parts of the northeast, for example, if you see in Nagaland and in other places, we see that migrant male labor is replacing the women labor in these areas. Now, Jhum rice festival is still there in the northeast, although the Jhum cultivation is seeing a gradual decline. Women are also involved in weaving and handicrafts. If you go to the villages, you will see that most of the families are involved in some kind or the other of weaving and most of their dresses are very beautiful with their own designs and their own weaving techniques. Weaving actually was a traditional occupation of women in the northeast. All tribal girls used to learn weaving at home from their older generations. They used to weave beautiful shawls, shadars, mekhalas, peacocks and pinnies, fennecs and inner peas. 
jansens and gamchas and other kinds of traditional attire with intricate traditional designs and these are the things which are even being sold outside of the tribal areas and they are even being exported. They are also adept in bamboo weaving. They make lovely hats, baskets, bags, mats, decoration items and many other articles like furniture which are used in our daily lives. And similarly, they do a lot of glass work and painting is also very famous. You must have seen a lot of tribal painting which is being sold outside of the tribal areas. Now the weaving and embroidery is so beautiful that it sells for a big price outside of their areas, but actually they do not get paid. It is the middlemen who take away most of the profits that are earned through whatever weaving and embroidery and handicraft that are being done by the tribals. Tribal women are also seeing a lot of domestic violence these days. Earlier times, the women of the tribal society were empowered very much more than today. Domestic violence on women is increasing on the tribal women, although it is still less than among the non-tribals. Tribal courts are often the simplest means of getting justice. It gives speedy justice for very little expense, but sometimes the decisions of such courts may be very brutal. For example, the Birbhum gang rape on 21st July of 2014, in which a 20-year-old tribal girl from Subolpur village was punished with gang rape in a Salishi Sabha because she had an affair with a boy who belonged to a different community. Now, Salishi Sabha is a Sabha, it is almost like what we have in North India in the form of a Khap they give uh, punishments according to the tribal laws. Now, there are many other kinds of violence on tribal women. It is not only domestic violence that they are facing, but there are violent activities going on through the state power. For example, in tribal areas, women are being subjected to violence at the hands of the police, the paramilitary and the armed forces. The Salva Judum, which was actually an armed militia which had been constructed and devised with the help of the government, was responsible for a lot of sexual oppression in Bijapur, in Bastar, in Dantewada and Sukma. And we know about the torture of Soni Sori. Soni Sori was a tribal activist who was working for the tribal women, but she was taken custody on false charges and while she was in jail, lot of torture was inflicted upon her and such torture which we have not heard in independent India, for example, stuffing stones into her private parts, these kinds of torture also happen. Cases of state repression have also come to light in areas like Narayan Patna and also other southern districts of Odisha and some tribal areas of Andhra Pradesh. We have also heard about the gang rape by army men of Thangjam Manorma in Manipur and this had led to a long movement to remove and repeal armed forces special power act there. We have also heard reports of state repression in Lalgarh of West Bengal. Now, Thangjam Manorama is a household name in Manipur. Many women's organizations and human rights organizations started a whole campaign for justice for Thangjam Manorama in the Northeast. Among tribal women, we see that entrepreneurship is much better than in other areas of India. But because of the low capital labor ratios, women are being confined to low productivity undertakings. The urban educated and higher class tribal groups 
take up all the businesses and the commercial enterprises in the urban areas. And the same is the case of families of the tribal village chiefs who have large land holdings and are able to have access to agribusiness. They also manage a lot of micro enterprises in dairy, in poultry, fishery, piggery, forest products, etc. But the gender discrimination and patriarchy in general becomes a big hurdle when it comes to women's entrepreneurship because they do not possess land or capital for investment. Now when we talk about property for the tribal woman, customary tribal law says that only women who have been widowed or they are single or unmarried can inherit land. These women may enjoy two kinds of land rights. One is a life interest in the land, the right to manage the land and its produce. And the second is to have a share in the produce while they don't own the land. So they cannot manage the land and they cannot use it according to their own discretion, but their produce may be shared for their maintenance and they can use it for other purposes also. And now, when there are only daughters, what happens? It is the sons-in-law who come to the wife's parental home and they inherit the property of the family. Tribal women have also been playing a political role in society. The tribal women in India do not have adequate representation in the parliament in many state assemblies as well. Also, their representation is not at all commensurate to the amount of sacrifice incurred by them and commensurate to their struggles. Because we have seen that women who have been fighting in the tribal areas have lost their lives, they have sacrificed everything that they had for the people, for the cause of the people, but still they do not get the kind of space they should be getting in the political system. But now some have come into the panchayats and the autonomous councils, but yet in the autonomous councils 33 percent reservation has not been granted to them. And we see that the number of MLAs and MPs who are tribal women are very less in the country. Now we will discuss the tribal women's movement. During the recent struggles in the Northeast or in Central India, especially in Chhattisgarh, which is most in the limelight nowadays, many tribal women have joined militant groups and their armies because that is the only way they can protect themselves and their land. They have left their homes and they have begun to take military training. In the Northeast, many young girls have become part of the movement for self-determination and several of them have become victims of brutality at the hand of the armed forces. So many of these tribal women have lost their lives. Of course, they are unnamed, many people don't know them, but they have lost their lives in the dozens. And as a protest, Iram Sharmila, who belonged to the Methi tribe from Manipur, had also sat on hunger strike, which lasted for 16 long years for the repeal of Armed Forces Special Power Act. Then there are many other tribal women's organizations coming up and mothers organizations and peace committees also coming up in which the tribal women are leading a better role. Now this Nupi Lan is also a very famous form of struggle of the tribal woman. The tribal women in Imphal have been famous for the women's war, which is also called Nupilan, in which they were fighting against the king and the British rulers. The tribal women's assertion has also been seen in the Naga areas. In the Naga areas, you see that women who used to be known as Pukharelias used to operate as peacemakers between warring villages. 
the pokarela woman used to stand and she used to have a y shaped staff in her hand and once she had said that there should be peace and the warring should stop the warring actually used to stop so they were known as ambassadors of peace and these were the women who did not have any political power but still traditionally their position in society was such that once they uttered a word everybody had to follow their dictates so these women were very powerful empowered women of nagaland women working in the chatisgarh mines shramik sang the cmss also have been very assertive and very active after the killing of shankar guhanyogi who was the leader of the workers in the mines in jharkhand also we have seen that the women have been asserting their rights there used to be some kind of a custom which used to be called jani sikar from 1610 in which the orao women used to wear army attire or men's attire and they used to ward off attacks on their fort today maoist women activists are also there in those habitations and they are very active in the movement now tribal women who have made a big difference to the life of common tribal women one is sandhya rani chakma who is a member of the ttaadc the tripura tribal areas autonomous district council and this had come into existence on 12th december of 1982 under the seventh schedule of the indian constitution dayaman mani varla is also one of the leaders or social activists or journalists who is a defender of human rights and whose work has centered in the state of jharkhand and she has been leading lots of struggles on the issue of displacement she is a prominent leader of the napm the national alliance for people's movement and also in the insaf dayamani actually used to be a housemaid and she used to be working in other places in the family and also she had been sleeping on railway stations because she did not have her own house so the women like dayamani barla and like sandhya rani chakma there are some such leaders like soni sori and others who are coming up and they have been giving a sort of assertion to the tribal movement and they are known not only in our country they are known internationally as well thank you